A quiet September night, a 20-something accountant sits on his couch watching TV when suddenly shots ring out with varied accounts of the confusion that ensued. Police swarmed the scene, but one cop had been there the whole time. A tragic case of deadly inattention and an innocent life lost as the result. This week's episode is Amber Geiger, Part 1. Up and in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Well, we live in Dallas, so this case is a bit inescapable. Um, yeah. But what's really interesting and maybe surprising is that this is all over the headlines throughout the country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, because I think of the, uh, outcome that we all get to in the second episode of this, the verdict, but also another white cop shooting an unarmed black man. Yes. Which is definitely not news. Yes. A little strange here. She's off duty. So. And yeah, yeah. But um, my therapist and I were actually talking about this yeah. case last week. And he said he was in L.A. the week before for something. And it was all over the news there. Yeah. I mean, and then I mean, like New York Times, Washington Post, Huffington Post. There's it's everywhere. Facebook. All over the all over the book. All over the book. All, all over the, the book. And maybe not so surprising, all over the Texas lawyer Facebook. So there's a secret Oh yeah, I bet. The secret lawyers only Facebook. You gotta scan your card, take a picture of your card and prove you're really a lawyer Ooh. to get in. Um and it yeah it, Was there a door? Uh yeah. It's, it's I mean it's a <laughs> private group. Is this just a room where all of you talk <laughs> exactly. but on your computers? <laughs> it's uh, like exactly how you imagine any Facebook group, just a dumpster fire. Okay, yeah. And my favorite comment was someone goes this thread reminds you that uh, just about anybody can get a law license. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a pretty sweet burn. Yeah, it's a good burn. Yeah, it's definitely been it's... the talk of the town and all over news stations and radio stations and we've our fair neck of the woods. DMs and I've gotten personal DMs and messages and questions just in my everyday life. Absolutely. So. And we've had lots of requests to do this case. Where this happened is 10 minutes from us. Yeah, so, pretty much. Right. I, I drive past it every time I go see a movie. All the time. It's right next door to the Alamo draft Alamo. house that we talk about all the time. That, I was driving to the Alamo one of, during one of the protests one of the days. Oh, so yeah. I was, you know, kind of got out of my car and parked and went down and watched. And it was the protest with the two coffins. Yeah. Two caskets. yeah. Uh, here's the thing. If you're not from Dallas... It certain so like when I lived in Chicago, they didn't really have apartment complexes. It would right. be like apartment buildings. Yeah. And so in Dallas, you have apartment co- and, and I'm sure in other large metropolitan areas, especially with nicer weather, you know, less snow, your door just opens to the outside. So it's not like an apartment building where you have to get buzzed in. And then there may be gates. There usually are some kind of gated situation. But this one, and you know, I just seen from the body cam footage, it's just, you know, long hallways, kind of concrete. And then each door opens to the outside. Which I think in some uh, other uh, states you'd be like that feels a bit like a motel, but here it's like pretty normal. I mean, a lot of apartments I've lived in, and yeah. usually the most build- of the ones I've lived in have opened directly to the outside. Mm-hmm. Tommy and I, before we got a house, lived in one where you had to buzz in, or if you mm-hmm. were a resident, you had a key, and then it opened interior, which I really liked because. Mm-hmm. It did. You did feel safer. I feel like to you, it's maybe better for climate control, but ne- nevertheless, hmm. uh, maybe I never noticed a difference. Uh, so it's just kind of a big, but this one's fairly well organized when you look at it because a lot of apartment complexes here are building after building after building, and it's you have to figure out what building and what unit. Versus this has an attached garage, so you can kind of drive mm-hmm. up to your floor and just walk straight, yeah. which is very convenient. It is, yeah, yeah. Well. I'm Christy. I'm Heather. This is a doozy of a case. Probably not going to be a very funny episode. (laughs) No, it's hard in these types of situations to find any kind of brevity. Yeah. A lot of times. But we're breaking it up into two episodes so we can really dig into some stuff. So in this first one, we're going to get through um, 
the incident and the state side. And then in the next episode, we'll get into the defense and Amber Geiger's actual testimony and the verdict and all the stuff leading up to current day situation. Correct. I think it's important that we do cover it because not everybody has the time to watch the entire trial. Dude, it's a, I mean, Google and you've got 50 pages deep on Google of articles. It's, it can be, it's the same like with Epstein. Mm -hmm. You need just a one, a one sheet thing to give you all the (laughs) highlights because you'll get just overwhelmed with all the information. And I think too, there's a lot of, you know, well, I read on Facebook, my cousin not said on Facebook. Oh, well, your cousin's an idiot. Yeah. I mean, honestly, (laughs) I mean, I agree, but. I think it's there's something to be said for either reading, looking at the documents from the case, which most of them are not available online. There are a couple of orders here and there are, but just watching the footage, which is fully available on YouTube. At any yeah, time. the trial was streamed, it was fully streamed. So, and you can still watch it on mm-hmm. if you want to see this trial. Just go to YouTube. Yep, it's all available. It is so. all there. Well, let's get into it. Botham Shim Jean was born on September 29th, 1991 on the eastern Caribbean island of St. Lucia, to parents Allison and Bertram. He was the middle child, with sister Alyssa, 10 years older than him, and brother Brant, 10 years younger. Botham's parents were devout Christians and raised their son in a home dedicated to Christ. Botham embraced this with his whole body and spirit, and at the young age of eight, told his parents he wanted to be baptized. Worried he was too young to fully understand the type of commitment he was intending to make, His parents initially denied his request. However, after two years of Botham demonstrating how important this was to him, his parents acquiesced, and at 10 years old, Botham was baptized. Were you ever baptized? I was, yes. I was baptized in the baptismal pool, I suppose is what they call it, Mm -hmm. at church. I want to say I was in fourth grade, maybe? Mm Mm-hmm. You were, I think we've talked about this. You were also baptized in a pool in Mesquite, right? The public swimming hole. (laughs) My dad one is it's all baptized in a creek, like the Bible. Yeah. But he's an originalist. (laughs) He's a purist. Yeah. Um, but we, I can't remember if. I can't imagine you would enjoy being dunked in a creek. Well, I thought it was kind of fun to be dunked in this pool. Oh, and no, I mean, I get a baptism. In a creek? I was, I, I mean, in today's age, I would be like, I don't want to be baptized at all. That's true. That's but true. back then, you know, that wasn't as much my decision. I'm trying to remember, I guess my youngest brother must have been a baby. So he may have just had the water sprinkled. I don't remember if he was there, honestly. But myself and my brother, Zach, were dunked in a pool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not so a, I guess a now we're all going to heaven. Or a pool. The baptismal okay. pool. Yeah. <laughs> you can swim but in it. But people do it at pools all the time. Yeah. Did he bless the entire pool and turn it into holy water prior to dunking you? No, I slid down the water slide. And was oh, at the nice. See, that is that is how, as an adult, I would want to get baptized. <laughs> exactly. Just do like a backflip off the high dive and then I'm going straight to heaven. Well, by his teenage years, both of them had begun preaching, wanting to serve the Lord any way he could. This included improving the church choir as well. In an interview with WFAA, Botham's mother, Allison, said he taught the choir to read music and even arranged them by sopranos, altos, bass, and tenor. According to Allison, her son was a perfectionist, saying, He always had a plan or proposal. She went on to say that everything Botham did was to impact the lives of people. He sounds like an amazing person, a person anyone would want to be friends with and that no one has a bad word to say about. Absolutely. And smart p- putting people, you know, going in and saying, why is everyone standing around singing just wherever? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should be more organized. Like we, and with the motivation of this will better serve our Lord. You yeah. know, it wasn't just, I think everybody could do a better job of singing here. It was, you know, for the purpose that they were there. Wanting to continue his education at a Christian college, both them attended Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas. Despite being thousands of miles from his home in St. Lucia, Botham's mother said he would go home every year while in college to show his friends and classmates where he came from and to volunteer at the local orphanage. His parents said he also called every Sunday, which is nice, too. That's so sweet. It was at Harding University that he also met Alexis Stossel, and the two quickly became best friends. 
In later testimony, Stossel said, Next to my husband, Botham was my absolute person. She also called him a natural leader and said people gravitated towards him. It didn't matter if you didn't know him personally. You always felt welcomed by his presence. When Stossel eventually married, she insisted to her husband that Botham, who she called Bo, would be a part of their lives forever. It was really emotional testimony from her, both in the trial phase and in the sentencing phase of just imagine. I mean, it's your best, best, yeah. best friend gone in the blink of an eye. Upon graduating in 2016, Botham was hired as an accountant at PricewaterhouseCooper, a prestigious multinational professional services firm that is second largest in the world. His coworkers loved his jovial and friendly nature. He was a delight to work beside and would even stand up to greet visitors at his desk. Just very beloved by all of the coworkers in an accounting firm, which is, you know, I would think generally a pretty serious place. Or know? very dry. Dry. Maybe not. I always just think of the accountants on uh, Parks and Rec with Ben, yeah. where he's like the only <laughs> fun, nice one. And yeah. they're like, oh, my God, Ben. Yeah. On the night of September 6, 2018, Botham, who was 26 at the time, was sitting in his apartment at the Southside Flats in Dallas, Texas, around 10 p.m. He had spent a long day at work and was relaxing on his couch, watching football with his laptop open, enjoying a late night snack of a bowl of vanilla ice cream. So, you know, normal evening at home. Yeah, just unwinding. Mm -hmm. We all do this every night in our own way. Yeah. Read in bed, watch I trashy TV. My spaghetti where I eat spaghetti in bed. Do you do that every night? Not every night. <laughs> That'd be a lot of spaghetti. It's a lot of nights, though. <laughs> hey, it's vegetable pasta, so it's healthy. Okay. It's made with chickpeas. But, you know, you sit... You just Everyone sit. has their unwind time. Your activity that you do that just be yeah. like, ah, oh, quiet. The lights were off and the only light was emanating from Botham's laptop. Suddenly, his front door was opened. Ballistic evidence later introduced at trial would show that Botham was either getting up or cowering, wondering who just entered his home. It was then that he was shot in the chest, with shots fired from his front door. His assailant, 30-year-old Amber Geiger, an off-duty Dallas police officer, then called 911, where it was revealed she thought she had been at her apartment and that Botham was an intruder. Per protocol, off-duty police are not equipped with body cams, so it is unclear exactly what happened in the moments immediately following Geiger shooting Botham. However, upon hearing two loud bangs and a man's voice allegedly shout, Oh my God, why did you do that? Fellow Southside Flats resident Bunny began filming on her cell phone from the hallway directly below Botham's floor. With a clear view of Botham's front door, Bunny captured an obviously distressed Geiger, still dressed in her police uniform, frantically pacing in the hallway directly outside Botham's apartment. Geiger is on her cell phone, and, according to Bunny, it sounded as if she was on a personal call and not 911. This was one of the very first videos that came out of it. Yeah, almost. I mean, that night, I think it got she, uploaded. She posted it to her own Twitter. And yes. so that's because everyone said, what's this commotion going on? Why are there so many cops at Southside Flats? And she obviously, you know, tagged the place. So everybody was able to see that footage and trying to early on trying to piece together why if there is a shooting and there's an officer on the scene, why is this officer running back and forth? Yeah. I think she was great to pull out the video and say, well, what the hell is going on? I mean, yeah. that's the number one thing that we have against any sort of tyranny i think is now we have phones in our pockets yep. and which doesn't always stop tyranny as we've seen in no some other no cases. it just it, it nope. documents it mm -hmm. and that's the question of you know is this pain at least is there something it, it's done in vain if we don't do something about sure. it you know if you see this and just go oh man it's like no that should make you upset and mad Absolutely. so that you can turn that you know bunny said she never saw geiger go in the apartment in an attempt to help both them in an interview with ABC News, Bunny said, It was just a lot of crying, a lot of hysterics. She was just pacing back and forth for at least seven minutes, according to my video. In that same interview, Bunny goes on to say that when paramedics and fellow officers arrived at the scene, one of the officers told Geiger she was, quote, doing too much, while another took away her cell phone. The video shows officers and paramedics rushing into Botham's apartment and moments later wheeling him out on a stretcher while efforts to save his life continued. Botham Jean was then transported to Baylor Hospital, where he later died. So, Bunny received death threats from uploading this video. Yes. She was fired from her job. Yes. Because they said, we do not want uh, people 
Recalling. doxed her and trolled her and found out where she worked and were calling her job and saying terrible things. And her boss said, we do not want our company associated with the high profile murder case. So we're going to let you go. I think that maybe she should probably call a lawyer. I think she might be in the process okay, of doing some good. legal stuff there. I'm not entirely sure what those laws are, but that's worth Good for her for not shrinking yeah. and saying, you know what? A job's a job. This, this is, is important. Very important, and a lot of it, a lot came from it as well. Initially, the Texas Rangers took over the investigation of the case at the request of Dallas PD Chief Renee Hall. On September 10th, 2018, four days after the shooting, the Rangers obtained a warrant for Geiger. However, before police would have to arrest her, she turned herself in at the Kaufman County Jail. There she was charged with manslaughter and posted a $300,000 bond. For those of you not familiar with the Dallas area, so Dallas is a uh, metropolitan, very uh, urban area. And then there's a lot of counties around that are more rural and a lot less populated. And Kaufman is one of those counties. Yeah. So although she lived in Dallas County and worked at the Dallas police headquarters, maybe when I may be incorrect, I believe her parents may have lived out there. I was going to say, why would you turn yourself in there? Uh, and can you? Yes, you can. So it doesn't matter. You don't. It's not like you have to vote where you're registered. You no. have to turn yourself in where you were. The crime commit. Was no. Committed. And it's like if you have a warrant in Dallas County and you're driving up north, almost trying to get to Oklahoma and you get pulled over in Grayson County, they can arrest you for a warrant. I mean, you still have an outstanding warrant. It's just they'll weird transport that you. she wouldn't have turned herself in at the police station that she worked at unless you wanted to turn yourself in at a place and i think she did it really late at night where there would not be any press yeah that's true to take your photos and people wouldn't know you and as much. dallas police headquarters or, or in the blue stare at jail and all that all those places are within i may mean, seconds from all the major abc nbc cbs yeah. and fox stations so the and dallas morning news reporters so they all could have been right on the scene versus kaufman county is I mean, it yeah. maybe it depends I'm sure on that's why it was depending on traffic. It could be an hour. There. Yeah. Yeah. Dallas County District Attorney at the time, Faith Johnson, a Republican, initially asked for patience in the case. In a statement she made after the incident on September 19th, Johnson said, we are investigating the case. It's still ongoing and we haven't slowed up. We're not necessarily concerned about doing it quick, but we are concerned about making certain it's right. We want to prosecute anybody who's going to break the law, whether you're a police officer or non-police officer. We have to say we are not going to tolerate bad apples doing bad things to good people, innocent people. Well, good for Faith. She was, uh, I think, in a rock and a hard place because this was September and the election was in yeah. November. We're coming right on the heels of and this. And she's, uh, I believe she was endorsed by the police association. So you, you I mean, you're just. She's a, having to play both and, sides. And the DA's office yeah. works with the police department. Yeah. I mean, these are your colleagues. Granted, you have a duty, you, you know. Moral you, obligation. Well, not, I mean, moral and obligation. And employment obligation yeah, you're legal you're you have to uphold the constitution sure. of the united states and texas so you you have to say hey sorry i know we work together all the time but i actually have to arrest you yeah but i think she did want to do it right but also i think it was like mm, maybe if i don't make a decision by the time the election comes i yeah. can keep my job yeah almost immediately after the killing dallas police chief renee hall was inundated with demands from the public that geiger be fired However, at the time, according to the Dallas Morning News, Hall stated that, quote, local, state and federal laws prevented her from firing the police officer. What would these be? That's a great question. I think you have to have someone that's charged before you can fire her. I mean, she was charged. She with had been charged with manslaughter. Well, so that's why she didn't fire her immediately. It took four days to charge her. The Were they just kind of trying to prolong the inevitable and bide their time before they had to make a they wanted to i'm a, i'm sure they wanted to do everything by the book correct because this was under a microscope already yes but because again you it's like you're it's two competing interests because you want your job is to protect and serve the people but also, your job is also to protect and serve your employees. Exactly. Yeah. And you don't want to say, well, we, and at this time, there was not, the investigation hadn't been conducted. So right. you don't have facts. So they didn't know. If, I mean, that makes sense. If they didn't know exactly what had happened if, yet, then they've got to wait. Yeah. And then I think once, you know, they, the Rangers get in there and start digging around and there's more and more body cam footage gets reviewed, then they're like, yeah, we're going to have to let yeah. you go. Sorry. In the days following the shooting, protesters began to take to the Dallas streets, 
fed up and angry that another innocent and unarmed black man's life had been taken by a white cop. They gathered outside of the Dallas police headquarters, marching several blocks down to the Dallas Police Association office, while their protests were met with pepper balls that an officer fired into the crowd. Not a good look. No. And these were peaceful protests, by all accounts. On September 12th, chants of no justice, no peace could be heard at the Dallas City Council meeting, stopping the council from conducting business. Four days later, protesters carried two coffins down Lamar Street near the Dallas Police Department headquarters, with one coffin symbolizing Botham Jean and the other symbolizing O'Shea Terry, a 24-year-old black man who had been fatally shot by an Arlington police officer during a traffic stop near the Dallas Cowboys Stadium just a few days before Botham's death. And that's the protest that I ended up seeing yeah. when I was going to Alamo. And at some point, there was another protest, or it may have been the same one, that, that stopped traffic on I-30. Yeah. And a younger Heather was subjected to protest. And subjected to sounds bad, but I encountered protests in Chicago. And I remember being young and stupid and going, get out of the road. I have to go to work. Mm. But when you think about the purpose of a protest, yeah. the purpose is to be disruptive and to say, stop and think and look at this. And... I think that in, it's going to cause you a minor inconvenience, but think about how lucky you are that that's the only inconvenient thing that's happening right. to you. And you don't have to, I don't know, be afraid to call the police. Nobody participates or starts a protest because everything's going well. Correct. Yeah. It's because we do need to stop and change needs to be enacted. Mm -hmm. And it takes being disruptive and getting them I don't I say getting in people's face in the sense of I can't drive where I wanted to go so I yeah. have to stop and like and you know uh, pay attention to this for a minute I went to the women's march three four years ago in DC the first one uh -huh. it was I mean it was life-changing but the amount of people that showed up to to voice their their mind and try and get some, I mean it was staggering and humbling mm -hmm. hundreds 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 of thousands of people so yeah think why are they doing this yeah and be mindful of, I mean I try to zoom out and say okay yeah I'm trying to get to X it's important otherwise I wouldn't be driving there but stop and think why is this going on what can i look into yeah. what can i do on my part to try to make anything better make get at least, out and join yeah jump out of the car at the very least just be respectful yes on september 24th 2018 amber geiger was fired from her job at the dallas police department that same day botham jean who had since been returned to saint lucia was laid to rest in his birthplace Prior to his burial, a vigil and funeral had been held at Dallas West Church of Christ, where Botham was a staple member of the congregation and a song leader for the choir. Fifteen hundred people attended his funeral, a true testament to how much he was loved, with many wearing red neckties in honor of Botham's favorite color. Fifteen hundred people at your funeral is a... That's a lot of people. I've, I mean, I, think about all the people who you knew and not just not just people that he knew, but people that he gave a warm feeling to. And yeah. that's the people that show up to your funeral. Yeah. No, I mean, that it's, you would hope. It's, a, it, on a, it's a true testament to how many people loved him and were affected by this. With Geiger fired and charges made, she began to assemble her legal defense team. For the prosecution, the election of a new Dallas County DA happened to be taking place that had the possibility of shaking things up. On November 7, 2018, incumbent DA Faith Johnson was defeated by Democrat John Crusoe, a retired judge who had spent 21 years on the bench as a felony district court judge, as well as seven years as an assistant DA and several years in private practice as a criminal defense attorney. In an interview with ABC affiliate WFAA in Dallas, on November 18th, 2018, just days after his election, D.A. Caruso said, Based on what I know, murder would be the most appropriate charge under the circumstances. This was a, I mean, watershed moment for that D.A. election because she had already been charged with manslaughter and there was an uproar from the community that this is a person that, and we'll get into the elements of the crime, but this is a person that opened a door, looked at a person and said, I am intentionally and knowingly taking your life now. And did that, and that's that's the definition of murder. <laughs> Do you think 
Faith may have lost because people were worried she was going to be soft on this issue. It was a way to get people to the polls. There were people that were out campaigning for Cruzo saying he will he, he's going to bring murder charges. He's going to bring murder charges. And particularly in communities of color that and there is everybody needs to get out and vote. But I think this whole entire case and then we'll I think we'll get into it kind of more in the next episode with like the sentencing. But this is so it shows why it's so important that you vote in your local elections. Mm -hmm. So you have DAs that bring proper charges. So you have a city council that makes sure that you have a good police chief like Renee Hall, who pays attention and listens to what the people are saying, but also says, I'm going to do, you know, go by the book because the, the police chief serves at the pleasure of the city council. Right. And so it's important that you have judges because in Texas, judges are elected. So yes. you have judges like Tammy Kemp who are amazing and should be on the bench. And so it's, People just kind of go, oh, well, the president election is coming up. And it's I like, I mean, arguably local elections are going to affect you way more way, than a presidential election, way more. And if you're talking about changing something like systemic racism and the weaponization of our justice system, which is what we're facing, it starts literally Absolutely. with those little signs that you see next to the elementary school where you go and vote yeah. those tiny signs, every single name on that sign super matters because it matters because when something goes down, they're the ones deciding what you're charged with. They're the ones that are going to pick the jury. They're the ones that are going to watch, you know, overrule the objections. And they're the ones that are going to, uh, you know, make sure the sentencing and everything gets carried out. So it's important. Get out and vote. Get out and vote. I mean, this this election, I think, and as a political expert and a criminal you justice are? expert, <laughs> I mean, I would say it. we very well could have seen her only charged with manslaughter. I... Again, I'm no political or criminal expert. I do wonder if this had not happened when it did, if we would have Cruzo. If he oh, would have been elected. It was the tides were turning to have a, Dallas is super progressive. And yeah, that's true. And he was he's like beloved. So you think and, it was it would think, have happened anyways? Yeah, I, I, it may have been close because she was a pretty well liked DA. But I think he this was helpful to him. Yeah. I don't think he would have lost. But for this happening. But I think it was a helpful to him and b helpful to us that we all got out and voted and had this result yeah. because had it been people got out and voted that may not have before this incident. Correct. And then the, that's the thing. Did not that he was a bad candidate, just that incumbents frequently just because people go, oh, she's it can be her. hard to beat because yeah, she just cert you just bubble it in mm -hmm. seeing that they're an incumbent. Yeah, exactly. Stay tuned for more Sinisterhood. You know what I love? What's that? open in presents i love i like because when i order stuff and i forget i ordered it it's a present from myself Ooh, from is. the past well the fab fit fun seasonal box subscription is like opening up your own gift from yourself or maybe someone else who knows it's true every single season it blew in like the wonderful cold front in dallas and now Ooh. i'm ready for fall with we all are. of this dope stuff we got i'm ready to keep away my fall crusty elbows with some humankind skincare with a conscience body souffle Ooh, this stuff smells so good it is very nice and it's, it's herbally yes but not overpowering and my hands are silky smooth and right vegan now and cruelty free which you love Perfect. i mean i love too but particularly <laughs> <laughs> i specifically really loved the microfiber hair towel because yes. as we all know flyaways are my Achilles heel Bang. and microfiber towels really help with that. But there are in these subscription boxes, you guys, eight to 10 full sized products every time you get one. And it's premium beauty, lifestyle, fitness, home, wellness, all kinds of products in there. So it's not just beauty products. Like this time there's a cheese tray. There's a cheese tray. I love cheese so much. There is body wash. There are some really fun sugar scrub cubes. I'm excited about the Wander Beauty under eye because I use Wander Beauty under eye concealer and these are under eye pads to take away my dark circles under my eyes. I'm super excited about that. What I love most is that they are all full size. I've yes. done subscription boxes before and they're all trial size. Which you're just left with a bunch of tiny bottles then. That, or yes. you really love it and you run out so quick. And it's gone. And also, each of these come with four products that you can customize in each box. So you just got to get on the site. And speaking of on the site, there is a fun and active community that you can sign up. There's FabFitFun TV. There's a FabFitFun community that you can talk to everybody. So normally the box is $49.99. But if you go to FabFitFun.com and use our coupon code CREEPY, you get $10 off your first box. And the products have a value of over... $200. So for a 
$49.99. Actually, our coupon's $10 off, $39.99. You get $200 worth of cool it's stuff. It's amazing. Yes. Again, go to www.fabfitfun.com. Enter code CREEPY. Get yourself something. Get someone you love something for the upcoming holidays. Self-care is so important. Treat yourself. You're the number one priority. FabFitFun. Well, in the last week of November 2018, a grand jury was convened in Dallas County to determine whether to indict Geiger for murder. After being presented with evidence, the grand jury had the options to indict Geiger for murder, for a lesser charge, or for no charge at all. Because grand jury proceedings are secret, there have been no reports of what evidence those jurors saw. So grand jury proceedings are very important because under the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, I believe, you can't be charged with a felony in theory, without being indicted by a grand jury. They can still bring charges. The prosecutor can still choose to bring charges. But the grand jury proceeding is uh, pretty useful as kind of a dress rehearsal for trial. So you, as the prosecutor, can bring out the evidence that you have, kind of gauge what the public's, or you know, what. So are the jury members selected like a normal jury would be? Yeah, I th- you get grand jury uh, summons just like you would get a jury oh, okay. summons, but it's just different. Uh, it's You just go to a different, you know, line. Are all... What what dictates that a something will be heard before a, a grand jury before it actually goes to trial? Not all cases do that, right? Felonies. So all felonies go to a grand jury first? Yes, most of the time. Okay. So especially high-profile ones, but then especially, not necessarily just high-profile ones, but especially things like murder. Or so the prosecutor assault. looks at it and say, or looks at how it goes in the grand jury proceedings and determines then... I think I could get a murder conviction or there's no way we got to go for manslaughter or she's getting off the hook. Yes. And then the special thing about grand jury is there's no rebuttal evidence from the defense. So it's a dress rehearsal in some sense, but it's not a full trial. And I there's no uh, ability to ask for the defense to ask questions. So it's kind of one sided. But really, the whole purpose of it is not to convict someone. The purpose is to say, yes, we think we have sufficient evidence to try to prove this case at trial. That's interesting. It's interesting that the defense wouldn't be able to say anything because wouldn't that affect what a jury thought they could if she was guilty of murder or not? I think the question is just, do you have sufficient evidence to bring charges? Like, okay, do you have probable okay. cause to bring this So they're not saying she's guilty. They're bring, just yes, saying to this is what someone. we think you could charge her with. So you charge somebody and then they're indicted. So it's sufficient. I misspoke. So it's sufficient evidence to indict someone. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. On Friday, November 30th, the grand jury indicted Geiger on charges of murder. After the indictment, Geiger turned herself in at the Mesquite Jail, where she was booked on the murder charge. She then posted her $200,000 bond and was released. Mesquite is my hometown. That is, so she has now gone to Kaufman and Mesquite. Yeah. Has yet to go to the Dallas County Jail. True. And Ka- Mesquite is 35-ish minutes outside of Dallas. And also just, it's gotten way, but way, way bigger. But it's still- I don't even think it's, I am closer to Mesquite than I am to downtown Dallas. Yeah. We're and I far live in East Dallas. 10 min- yeah. So from, you mean from the Dallas yeah, Police. center, like the center of Dallas. Yeah, yeah. You know, once you. So once you my question traffic. is: so she posts her two hundred thousand dollar bond, and then she gets to stay at home while Correct. this is going on. Yes. So every day when she goes to trial, she's coming from her house. Yes. Okay. But if you can't pay your bond, then you're in jail. Correct. Man, she had a three hundred thousand dollar bond and a two hundred thousand dollar bond. Usually you have a bail bondsman and they make you put up 10%, I think. Okay. And then if you skip town, you owe them that money. Right. And then it, regardless, they keep that percentage. Okay. So she's put up about $50,000 at this point on bonds. Yes, I believe so. In January of 2019, because of an increase in media coverage, Judge Tammy Kemp, who had been assigned to proceed over the high profile case, issued a gag order. A gag order prevents both the prosecution and defense from making public statements about the case. And it says in the order that she signed that because statements from either side could be detrimental and prejudicial to the defendant receiving a fair trial, Mm -hmm. you know, for the sake of protecting her constitutional rights. Because at this point, the jury for her case has not been selected and people all over the place are watching the news and seeing. I honestly think. In cases like this, unless you've been out of the country, there's no way you haven't heard something about it. For sure. And I think that's part of the reason why there's a motion to change venue does not all the reason, but part of it. Sure. Yes. Several pretrial motions were considered before opening statements began. 
Particularly, the state wanted to introduce evidence of data taken from Geiger's cell phone that showed Geiger's text in the moments after the shooting. The evidence was allowed to be presented. Geiger's defense team also made an oral motion for a mistrial following comments from District Attorney John Cruzo that were aired the night before the trial began, in which he stated that murder was the proper charge. The defense felt this violated the gag order Kemp had put in place. This is a very now famous Twitter video of Judge Kemp repeating back to the defense because the defense had judged, you know, we'd like to move for a mistrial. There's the DA was making comments and she's like, I'm sorry, did you just say the sitting DA made comments the night before the trial? And she kind of like gets up from the bench. It's uh, someone tagged me in it on Twitter while I was in Spain, actually, is why I saw it. And you can just tell she's incredibly frustrated because her order was very clear mm. and it had been in place for months at that point. And it's the Sunday night before trial starts Monday morning and this interview airs. I mean, she, I would be wear me out. hopping mad. You're like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. Also, because this DA is not a newbie. He's been in the business. Right. 21 years or more. Judge Kemp questioned the jurors and all juror alternates all answered that they had not seen the interview or any media coverage about the case since they were chosen for the trial. With that, Kemp allowed the proceedings to continue. So at this point, the juror has the jurors have been selected. Correct. During the gag while the gag order was put in place. Yes. And so it's the gag order was in place from January and then the trial the jury selection started, I believe, two weeks before the trial began, so early September. And I can imagine so Jury selection, I think there's a misconception that people are chosen to be on the jury. No, but, you're stricken from it. Yes, exactly. What it is is a big pool of people and it's whoever's left standing. Yep. <laughs> I was, when I was served on the jury that I did, Oh yeah, I was number seven, I think. Mm -hmm. I might have been number one even. I was, I was in the top 10 and I was like, well, I'm getting selected. Yes. If you're in the top, pro usually if you're in the top, 10 or 11 like it starts to especially because yeah, all like, they're doing is like okay well this person can't be because they said they would never uh, find a, a cop guilty of murder yeah. in this situation or you I know, can't be biased their dad yeah. is a cop but or, if you're neutral your ass is getting on that jury for sure if you're if you're up there in the numbers so that, but also people are always complaining about jury duty it is a privilege for, and your civil duty to do it so I encourage you next time you get chosen for jury duty, be to excited. embrace it and and enjoy the experience as much as one can enjoy being on a jury like this. But also, I learned so much mm -hmm. after the case was over. The judge invited all the jurors back in and we got to sit and just talk with the defense and prosecution and ask them questions about why did you do this? Why did you do that? They asked us questions about what they could have done better. It was very interesting. Those are the nicest attorneys ever. Yeah. I love yeah. That. So and it's also just I mean, you have a lot of I don't want to say power in a way that like you should abuse it, but it's an honor and a privilege to and you should treat it as such. Think about if you or someone you love was in the defendant's chair or you or someone you love was a victim. You want someone like yourself mm -hmm. who's level headed, clear minded and wants to and be paying there. attention, wants to be there. Isn't mm -hmm. going to just be like, I don't give a shit. I'm ready to get out of here and go home. Guilty. Boom. Let's go. Yeah. Like the OJ case. God. <laughs> but, I, you know, and I will say my one of the judges I work for always said the justice system ideally keeps us from the wild west method of someone done something wrong to me so i'm gonna go and get revenge he's like the purpose of this is if someone robs you or if someone swindles you in a contract you have the ability to go to court and have a jury of your peers help you out and and met out justice and it doesn't work if people don't show up and there's mm -hmm. dallas i haven't checked the, the statistics recently but when i was in law school it was dismally low it was to the point that they what started was? the people showing up participation turnout people just flat out like they wouldn't even send they did say for this case people sure. were around the block i'm sure everybody but how up. do you know you don't when you i went know. i didn't know do but people you, just think like well this is probably going to get selected soon so well if it's like oh they're doing jury selections in the geiger c case this week and you look at your paper and say i have jury to do yeah. this week you put two yeah and two they together. said that there were lines around the block of so the courthouse so suddenly everyone showed up which is good and i, I mean, yeah that is good because people wanted to be there and, and uh, i bet the the veneer panel was, I mean, 200 people. Because I saw, yeah. I did a, um, I sat in on a um, wrongful death 
for asbestos, like a mm. guy that was exposed at his job. And there were 200 people on that because it was a really contested matter. He had mesothelioma is what killed him, mm-hmm. but he also was a smoker and had lung cancer. So it was just such a polarizing yeah. topic where they would go, how many of you in here think if someone has lung cancer and they die of mesothelioma, they deserve to die? And like 50 people raise their hand and they're like, <gasps> all of you are dismissed. And I was like, rude. Because <laughs> it's two different diseases. His yeah. and the One didn't, there was But experts. also I think in those cases, people just want to get out. True. And like, yeah. I'll and that's the trick. For this. Yeah, yeah, that's the trick is if you raise your hand. I was so. very, I wanted to be there. I wanted to serve on it. I've never been so Selected for a jury. Yeah, it was the only to... time I have. It was also a wrongful death case. I've talked about it before. Yeah. It was an infant and it was heartbreaking and sad. In Vordire, there were, I think, like six or seven people, but the vic- the baby's parents were there. They stayed there? Yeah, they were there the whole time. I mean, we were selected within an hour that trial started. Yeah, it starts right it's, away. It was right away. It's yeah. pretty quick. This one, I think, because it would be such a... There's so many people you'd have to because you'd say, have you seen anything that would prejudice your opinion? Yeah. And the idea is that you you're under oath. You say yes. You tell the truth. Don't lie. But if you truly can be fair and impartial, despite all the things you've seen, then then it's your like you said, it's your civic duty to, mm-hmm. to serve. Mm-hmm. So well, in an interview with public radio station KERA, D.A. Cruzo cleared up the misconception that he had violated the gag order. First of all, I did not give an interview the night before. Without talking about the case, I was sent an email talking about the recent death of an assistant DA in my office. The journalist had seen me talk about that and the emotional impact that it had on me. So I was asked to do an interview on that. That's what my interview was about. And I was told that was what the story that would air would be about. And I will leave the rest to your imagination. So the media took some liberties with this and kind of spliced two stories together, which implicated Cruzo had said things about the Geiger case when in fact he was saying it about a completely unrelated case. Yeah, and I think that his implication is that he hasn't outright said, but I think that the footage of him talking about it or he maybe just said, oh yeah, I confirm it. And they were, the gag order allows them to talk generally about cases, but mm. not to say, in this case, I Amber think Amber Geiger needs yes, to be yes. convicted of murder. Right? And so I think his implication was, I was called to talk about something else, I talked about it, and they miss edited it or maybe like edited it in a misleading way sure on october 3rd 2019 just days after the trial would end judge kemp entered an order to show cause requiring da cruzo to appear in her court on october 31st and explain how his interview did not violate the gag order if she holds that he did violate the order cruzo could be held in contempt and subject to jail time yeah if you Violate a judge's order. They have the broad power to hold you in contempt, and that includes putting you in jail. I don't think in this case you would put him in jail because it's kind of moot. Normally, you put someone in – if someone's in contempt, you would put them in jail to make them comply. So if the order said, I order you to tell me X, which I think is why DA Craig Watkins in like 2013 got put in jail because he was – he he was withholding some kind of information. I don't I don't remember all the details, but normally it's the judge says, tell me X. And you say, I'm not going to tell you. And they go, OK, well, I'm going to hold you in contempt and I'll put you in jail until you tell me. So here's my question. The d- defense tried to get it dismissed because they said he violated it. They tried to get a mistrial. So then they were got a, a new jury. Yeah. But she said Kim said, no, we're going to proceed because the jury says they didn't see the interview. If. In this order to show cause thing, if he shows up and she decides based on what he says, yeah, you did violate the gag order, could it then be... Can you have like a mistrial after she's already been convicted? I mean, she's already been... Spoiler alert. She's convicted. Yes. So that's already happened. Yes. So this this is kind of just like to, to like cross our t's and dot our i's well and i think it's 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 the right thing to do judge kim shouldn't say well it's kind of a moot point she had an order she said do not violate this order i think she probably waited till after the trial because she didn't want to muddy the waters of bringing him in. that was what i was wondering why would you wait until after all is said and done to then do something because it it. didn't affect the trial because none of the jurors saw it so that was irrelevant but at the end of the day you still have a sitting da who allegedly but according to him did not violate a gag order so it's She's being fair and balanced. Yeah. Her job is to enforce the orders that she gave. So she's doing it. So you mentioned a second ago how they were wanting the defense wanted to have the jury. The the whole trial moved somewhere out of Dallas County. Correct. 
where did they want it moved, Heather? So part of your right as a defendant is to have a fair jury pool. And so to move the trial from a place where there's been, an, a, say, an oversaturation of media coverage, you file a motion to transfer venue. They did that. And you can also file a motion to transfer venue if, say, something's been filed in the wrong county or whatever. But in this case, it was the allegation was that there was such media coverage that it was an unfair jury pool. However, the suggested venues that they suggested to change the uh, trial to was Kaufman County, Grayson County, Ellis County, Rockwell County, or Fannin County. I looked. What do those things have in common, Heather? I looked up the racial makeup of all of those. Hmm. They all have over eighty percent, and in some cases, eighty-seven to eighty-eight percent white residents. And the most uh, black residents I saw in one county was ten percent, but other than that, it was about seven or eight percent. So one might argue, yes. That the reason they wanted it moved was to get more white people on the jury well, because they thought it would benefit their clients. And Dallas County is 28 percent white, 22 percent black and 41 percent Latino. Mm-hmm. So it we definitely have more diversity here diverse, than those so. um, r- more rural counties that surround us. Yeah, I mean, it's really it's not. Listen, it's our question that we asked, you know, when we think about the OJ trial is you as a lawyer are it required to zealously represent your client. And that includes trying to get them every possible advantage that you can. Yeah. But I mean, you're going to the idea that you're going to move to a less racially diverse place is going to increase your chance for acquittal. So it's a maybe in the eyes of, you know, every citizen, that's a dirty trick. But when you are burdened with the zealous representation of this person, you have to say, well, what's one thing that can help? And also, they may have had a good faith argument that there is you cannot turn on the news without this being in front of you. But guess what? The, it's, um, Kaufman and Ellis and all, every place you were they're watching in L.A. All y'all are watching Fox 4 News. Yeah, Let me just say. Absolutely. We're waking up with Tim Ryan in the morning. I, I totally agree. The the D or the her attorneys have an obligation to try and do that. It's always just like, come on, guys, let's just be honest. Like, it's transparent to the public to see this is clearly why you guys want to have it. And it's one thing if it was like, man, we really need to move it to Waco or Austin or somewhere. But at this, I mean, I think for this case, it was all over the news everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that it could have been in Texas and not been all over the news. And kudos to Kemp for saying, nah. We're going to keep it we'll here. Be fine here. So and it ended up 12 people on the jury and then four alternates. And of that total pool, seven were black, five were non-black people of color and four were white. So 12 members of the entire pool were women and then the other four were men. So that's a pretty Dallasy jury yeah. pool. Yeah. I mean, we're diverse. Yeah, the alternates were all women and it was two black, two white. And then on the actual jury were it was too white and everybody else was a person of color. Yeah. So, and I think it's important that you have a representative. It's a jury of your peers. Absolutely. Definitely. Prior to the opening statements, Judge Kemp instructed the bailiffs to let more people into the gallery to watch the trial, saying, This is the people's courtroom. Let the people come inside. The two sides painted drastically different pictures of the events the night of September 6, 2018. The prosecution stated that Geiger made unreasonable errors, unreasonable choices, errors that only she could have stopped from happening again and again. For her errors, both of them paid the ultimate price. Lead prosecutor Jason Hermes said that Geiger had multiple opportunities to notice she was on the wrong floor of the apartment. She walks past 16 different apartments and fails to register the number four on any one of them. These numbers were displayed by lighted signs outside each unit. In addition, one of Geiger's neighbors had a large decorative planner outside her front door. Botham also had a bright red welcome mat in front of his door, which Hermes held up for the jury to see, where Geiger had nothing in front of her own apartment door. In addition, the third floor of the parking garage, where Geiger would have normally parked, was closed in. However, the fourth floor was open air, allowing a view of the outside. So there's a lot of chances for her to realize I'm on the wrong floor. And that's part of the testimony that they have from other people, too, that each of the cases of the neighbors who maybe went to the wrong floor, he always said, Jason Hermes always said, so what tipped you off? And they're like, oh, the planter wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I noticed, you know, I think the biggest thing for me would have been the doormat. Because you have to look down at the key. You're looking down to put your keys. You pull your key out and you're looking at your phone. Unless that. But you're also standing on it. Like you would notice 
there's a textural the change on the on the ground because padding. the it's concrete. Mm-hmm. So in front of her door, she had nothing. It's just gray concrete. He has a red welcome mat. Mm-hmm. It's kind of cir- semi. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, or a half circle. He holds it up in court, and it is bright, bright red. On the other hand, Geiger's defense team painted a picture of an exhausted Geiger who, upon returning home from a draining 12-hour shift, had been on autopilot and mistakenly entered Botham's apartment thinking it was her own. Her attorney emphasized that Geiger reasonably believed she was in her apartment and she had no choice but to use her gun to keep from dying. I'm going to say we always have a choice. I mean, and that's the trial. And like I said, here's the thing. I don't don't want to get self-righteous here. But for everybody on Facebook, watch the footage. I watched all of it. It's exhausting. It's freaking exhausting. Trials are exhausting. But guess what? This is a person whose life was lost. And so making a super quick judgment or reading a single paragraph on Facebook is not going to cut it. And that's what right. these jurors were in this room and heard. And some of the stuff they didn't hear, which you can want, you get to watch it on the live stream when the jury is removed. But it is it's second by second by second. And just the minutia and the, the details that seem so laborious to go over. It's so important to go over it because it is in the details and the conviction mm-hmm. is in the details. And this, this prosecution team was very v- thorough and very organized. And that's, that's why the, the outcome as far as the, 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 uh, conviction, conviction. was came out. The prosecution's case was built on the witness testimony of Dallas police officers, Texas Rangers, forensic specialists, and those familiar with the Southside Flats, residents, neighbors, and an employee. According to the testimony presented at trial, the night of the shooting was relatively quiet at Southside Flats. Multiple residents testified that they heard nothing out of the ordinary until the two loud bangs of Geiger's gun. After the shots rang out, two neighbors heard a woman's voice saying she went into the wrong apartment. The forensic expert's testimony indicated that Botham was sitting on his couch eating ice cream when Geiger breached the door and began shooting. Additionally, the trajectory of the bullet indicated he was in a position of coming up from the couch when he was shot. I think this is a very important piece of evidence is that that what we'll describe about the medical examiner, because it shows not a forward motion running towards, but a head pointed toward the assailant. And then that's the it was trajectory. not a threatening position he was taking. No, more of like, you know, when you, you know, more of I, like, what the hell is happening? Who like, just came through my scrambling front scrambling to stand up yeah. or anytime I try to stand up because my bones are old and hurts. <laughs> Same. According to the medical examiner who performed Botham's autopsy report, Botham suffered a gunshot wound to the left side of his chest where the bullet struck his heart, traveled down through his diaphragm, down into his stomach, struck his intestines twice and finally lodged in a left abdominal muscle. So it's going in a downward motion, not so if someone's running at you and you shoot, it's going straight. It's more like a through through. Yeah, it's going to have a more of a straight shot. This is you're shooting someone from standing from above. Yes. And she's she was way shorter than him. Yeah, definitely. Expert testimony also indicated the shots were fired from the front door toward the couch as shown by a 3D model of his apartment and the trajectory of the bullet lodged in the apartment's back wall. So she fired twice. Mm -hmm. One hit him in the chest. The other lodged in the back wall. I'm assuming the first one lodged in the back wall and the second one is the one that hit him. Yeah. I don't think they can tell. Yeah. It was bang, bang. I would just hope that. Well, fuck. I mean, I hope she I wish she hadn't done any of this. But if she shot him and then tried to shoot him twice after she already shot him. After shooting both them, Geiger made a call to 911. The call, which was played in court, paints an extremely upsetting picture. This this is I'll tell you what damning evidence. Y'all know I have a lot of hot takes and don't hide my opinions. I reading this, I, I told Heather I can't listen to 911 calls. There's some things that I just can't do. And listening to people in the throes of the worst moments of their life is one of them. But reading this is infuriating to envision what was happening in this scene. This made me be like, fuck her. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the, the scenario of like. There's a difference between like, well, I guess it's, my question is, what is the definition of evil? And is evil mm. necessarily maliciousness? Is if you say I no, define I, don't think so. I define evil as someone that's like I'm gonna kill someone today, or could evil be, or not even evil, but maybe 
sin or I don't I don't really know the right term. I'm trying to grapple with it as a person who doesn't think that human beings should just be thrown away. Right. That there's maybe some some hope for every person. But also like this is coming like the, the I true... think it's evil, but it's pure arrogance and self-preservation. Well, yeah. It, well, it's it's just self uh, you know, and we're all we all have self interest, right? But and self preservation, and self preservation. But and and we all do, right? Sure. But in this situation, it's uh, a. It's, here's the shitty thing about certain jobs. I'm a lawyer. I'm held to a higher standard. You steal some money sure. from a Girl Scout troop, you maybe get a slap on the wrist. I could lose my law license, right? Yeah. Or you're a doctor, you're held to a higher standard if you start helping somebody on an airplane. You're a cop, you're a fireman. If you're a firefighter and, you know, your house catches on fire in the night and you have a wife and three kids and you just get up and run out. <laughs> yeah. Then maybe you shouldn't be a firefighter because yeah. the, when the shit goes down, you don't give a shit. And you're yeah. not helping anybody. You know, that's your training kicks in. And I genuinely listen. This is me coming from reading the only plane in the sky, the oral history of 9-11. That is, if you want something that just gives you hope back in humanity, but also it just shows you that the people who genuinely should be police officers and firefighters and EMS are genuinely better human beings than me. You're just a better person. When the shit is on fire, when there's shots ringing yeah. out, guess what? You're going to find me hiding underneath the... You're, they are running into... into the, They're, they're run- running into the depths of hell You'll and find while me, everybody else is running away trying I'll to get... Safe. Hiding in a dumpster yeah, or hiding yeah. in the closet. Like, I am a... You know, I will be George Costanza pushing the kids and the old ladies out to get out of the fire. Right. Where this... When you undertake that oath to protect and serve and defend you are genuinely a better person than me a person like this when it's when it's the critical moment when all of that shit flies out the window and you go i don't know i was just so scared i freaked out and i just did this thing that is not a person whose everyday job should involve holding a gun absolutely not that's that's what and then this call this call begins the evidence that comes out that shows at no point should this person have been walking nope. around with the gun well, after Geiger provides the operator with her location, the 911 operator then asks Geiger what happened. I'm an off-duty officer. I thought I was in my apartment and I shot a guy thinking he was uh, thinking it was my apartment. The operator asks for clarification. You shot someone? Geiger continues. Yes, I thought it was my apartment. I'm fucked. Oh my god, I'm I'm sorry. The operator then asks Geiger where she is, to which Geiger replies, I- I'm I mean, what do you mean? I'm inside the apartment with him. She then says to both them, "Hey, come on." The operator asks for her name, and Geiger replies between breaths, I'm Amber Geiger. I need... Get me... I'm in... The operator assures Geiger that help is on the way. Through tears, Geiger then says, I know, but I'm... I'm going to lose my job. I I thought it was my apartment. Uh, She then says, I'm going to need a supervisor. Followed by... Hey, bud. Hey. Hey, bud. Several times to both them. Geiger repeats, I thought it was my apartment. And says, I could have sworn I parked on the third floor. She also says, oh, my God, I'm done. And I didn't mean to. Three times. In total, she says, I thought it was my apartment. 19 times throughout the five minute and 38 second call. So where's your mind focused on covering my own ass? It sounds it's the, the initial statement is like an epiphany. I thought it was my apartment. And the night, the 18 times subsequent is repeated like a mantra. She's trying to convince herself of what just happened is what that sounds like. But at no point does she say, I got to put the phone down. I'm doing I, CPR. Exactly. No. I need to fucking get in my bag of medical aid that I have with me. My trauma tape. And try and save this guy's life. Who at this point is still alive. Yes. He's, he's laying moaning. on the ground, bleeding out, moaning. And she instead. Well. Let's find out what else she was doing in addition to making a 911 call. I will just say, too, I mean, you did not, and that's, I get it. You don't want to listen to it. So I had to listen to this while I transcribed it. The way it makes me, I'm sorry, it just makes me so incensed and fucking angry. Yeah. That when a, because when you get shot in the heart, your heart is pumping out blood. Yeah. And she says, I'm going to lose my job. Yeah. Fuck you, man. No. (laughs) It's very upsetting. I'm going to lose my job to think what he was going through that you're sitting there going, first of all, what just happened to me? And second of all, why is this? And if you can open your eyes and see, oh, go, oh, thank God a cop is here. Oh, they're just fucking standing there. Yeah. Help me, please. I mean, I imagine you would think 
my home is being invaded. Yeah. Someone's breaking in to kill me. I imagine when he was shot, he was not Hopefully. Well, and the, one of the experts does testify. He's like, I can't, A, yes, he was in pain, but he's like, I can't tell you, I can't tell you how long before I lost consciousness or whatever. Yeah. And I mean, or before he lost consciousness. He's bleeding out so profusely. But even then, fucking get down there and hold his hand and be there with him in the last moments of his life that you just took. Yeah. And like I said, th- this is a scenario when your your burden that you have is this this calling that you've answered to be a police officer is what exactly and and kudos to the Dallas police because you see it on their body cam what every single other one of them does they run in and they push this person who's not doing anything out of the way and immediately their colleague that's not doing they, anything they are sprinting to get there they jump on the ground they start trying to do as much as they, they're lifting his legs they're I mean so it's that's what that's what you're supposed, supposed to, do. to do I am a stay at home mom and a podcaster and a comedian if I shot someone and was on the phone with 911 I would be saying how do I save this guy's life can yeah. you tell me what to do oh fuck I hugely fucked up what can I do to save this man's life yeah and it's and it, to to be fair we all don't know what we would do but I think you could say I don't think I would be worried about losing my job. No. That's just so my I would be just horrified at what I just done. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough to read and it's tough to listen to. Yeah. yeah. I mean it's tough to just hear about it. Well, at the conclusion of the call, two responding officers arrived. Their body cam footage shows them performing life saving measures on both of them. Shortly after two more officers arrived to assist. After that, EMS arrived and transported an unresponsive and heavily bleeding both them to the hospital. And they, I mean, it was so much blood. It was pulling on the stretcher and there was a trail behind him. I mean, it was just. This is also all on Bunny's video. Yes. Where he is wheeled out on a stretcher and there is a cop. I want to say there's a cop straddling him on the stretcher. Mm-hmm. Perform, trying. Trying pushing. to revive him while they're And I think EMS had arrived too. Yeah, yeah, they're hustling down to get him into the, the Two officers arrived, then two more arrived, then EMS arrived, and then all four of them. Body cam footage shows that while other officers attempted to revive both of them, Geiger stood nearby on her phone, apparently texting. The footage also shows officers putting on blue latex gloves before beginning to render aid to both of them. The prosecution entered the latex gloves from Geiger's uniform into evidence, noting that they were clean and unused. Additionally, a forensic expert testified to a dark substance found on Geiger's uniform, initially believed to be blood. However, forensic testing showed that substance was not blood. So she has literally not a drop of his blood on her, proving she did not make any attempt to save his life because she testified, didn't even kneel down next to him as i say and she testifies oh i was i was performing a sternum rub it was a thing and we'll get into her testimony in the next episode but alleges that she was performing a sternum rub and here's the thing a it was a traumatic night so maybe she doesn't remember and b for your own conscience do you tell yourself when you go to sleep at night no i tried i tried i tried to save him i was there i tried to save him and then the evidence comes guess out. what fuck your own conscience well i was gonna say i mean it's almost like a coping mechanism but i was gonna say and then the evidence comes out and goes you didn't yeah, do shit no. you know what your hand was because she called 911 and while the operator was on the phone She's she was texting texting in that five minutes and 38 seconds, yeah. that's why that cell phone data and everyone's like, she, you're slut shaming her. how you're going to text and try and save someone's life at the same time. You got to have both your fucking thumbs to text. Yeah. Certain dash cam footage appeared to show that Geiger was given special treatment by Dallas police and Dallas police association personnel on the scene. The state argued to Judge Kemp outside the presence of the jury that Geiger was placed in the front seat of the patrol car without handcuffs and allowed to have her cell phone. She was also repeatedly told not to talk as there was audio and video recording equipment in the patrol car. And apparently they brought her downstairs and to her credit, Sergeant Valentine, who was kind of in charge of corralling Amber, goes, hey, will you wait here and I'll go get the car and goes over and gets her patrol car and goes, OK, here, sit in the front seat of the patrol car. Yeah, you can have your phone. And on the stand, they ask her, was this protocol? Would you have done this with any other defendant? And she says, no, I should not have done it. And, you know, my commanding officer has already told me that this was all I did it wrong. I'm, I take responsibility for Does it. Does anything happen to her? No. And I think she she did have a good faith belief at the time. She's like, I didn't know she was off duty at the time. 
she's like, I just showed up. And there's Does that like, matter. Well, if there's an officer involved shooting in the line of duty, then you don't necessarily assume that it was. I mean, you would assume that there is. They had a reason. There to. was a reason to do it or whatever. But she's like, well, I didn't really know. And, I, you know, we thought it was officer involved. And then the problem comes in in this next part. Additionally, Dallas Police Association President Michael Mata asked for the in-car video to be shut off and removed Geiger from the patrol car, deviating from normal police protocol. Defense objected to showing the video as the video would be prejudicial and that questioning about special treatment Geiger received would be inflammatory to the jury and irrelevant. How is that irrelevant? The, Are they saying regardless of the treatment she received after, it doesn't impact what just happened? The question that the jury has to answer is, did you, defendant, knowingly and intentionally cre- commit this act that caused the death of another person? So what how happened this, after how is, this video is, is irrelevant. Yeah. It would be a separate case, perhaps, looking into a special treatment or and, a corrupt police system or something like that, but it really doesn't affect what she did. That's the, exactly when you ask of, and so there's all these rules of evidence. And again, it's, I love you guys. I love it. Here's the, the thing. I was on a panel today at the law school and one of the lawyers goes, I just want to warn all you law students that being in here is going to mess your brain up because <laughs> first of all, it's going to make you think in a really weird way. And second of all, it's going to make you insufferable to everyone you know. And that's very accurate. But the thing, I think the thing about lay people, when you watch the trial, you say, well, that that's relevant. I think it's relevant. It's like, okay, well, there's, it's not the term that we all know of relevance. It's like, there's, would it have changed the outcome? Yeah. The question is, does this have value that helps the jury answer the question did this person knowingly and intentionally take the life of another how that how does that right. help yeah and so, uh, then here's a little side story about this whole situation i watched this whole argument so what happens is they have sergeant valentine on the stand and then they're playing the video so the jury sees a first chunk of this video and then what the prosecution wants to show is the treatment that she received and all that and ask these questions but i think the reason uh, not the reason but i think it really would be inflammatory to the jury because it's your and you're just going to piss off the jurors because yeah and that's and the prosecution knows that i mean they know that it's not relevant to the verdict i mean he was trying to make a good argument just like just like the defense is trying to get the trial move to benefit their client the prosecution is doing everything they can to get the verdict for their client exactly is it the most does it make you feel icky on both sides yeah sometimes but if you're in, if you're <laughs> in either one of those chairs on either mm-hmm. side of that courtroom, you're going to hope that your attorney's doing the same thing. Absolutely. And he, he also, um, objected on the grounds that it would be more prejudicial than it would be probative. And that's another bar that you have to climb over whenever you're trying to get mm-hmm. evidence in that it's not that it brings more than it pisses people off because all evidence is prejudicial. Otherwise the other side wouldn't bring it, but it fits so in this case, it makes him look so bad because she's just hanging out in the car and just yeah. kind of texting and looking around. And then you see Mike Mata come up and he leans in the car and he starts talking to her and then he takes her and he pulls her out of the car. And then there's another shot from above from the security footage that shows him walk her to the side and privately talk to her. Because he knows there's no camera there. Well, he didn't realize that there was a security camera up above him recording what he was doing, but... He alleges in the media and he's there's a full investigation and he welcomes the investigation because he says, I've done nothing wrong. I was following protocol. The protocol is when the defendant's attorney or the police officer, if there's an officer involved shooting, but if there's a defendant in the car and there's audio and video on, if the defendant's going to have a call with their attorney, then you turn it off, which is great. You want that to, you know, you want there to be privacy. And the prosecution actually said, when we accidentally get dash cam footage that has attorney client conversations, he's like, we don't watch it. We send it back. We notify the defense. Hey, we accidentally got this footage. I'm going to send it to you. We're not going to use it. But my question is, I don't see her pick her phone up and I don't see him hand her her phone. So it's a great argument. And if it's true, then then they've done nothing wrong. I mean, they shouldn't have put her in the front seat. Maybe should have handcuffed her. I mean, there were some, they're kind of hugging her. It was uh, pretty. There was some special treatment going was, on for sure. It was very prejudicial mm-hmm. because it, or it's very inflammatory because it just shows all these cops just hugging her and she's crying on their shoulder, which they're all coworkers. I mean, I get it. But in this case, sometimes you have to say, Hey, man, I love you, but this is protocol. I got to fucked up and you yeah. fucked up. We got to put you in the back seat. And yeah. they weren't. And Mike Modic takes her out of the police car and walks her to the edge. He, like I said, he alleges that her and 
he alleges that the attorney was on the phone. And if there is evidence of that, then maybe they didn't do anything wrong in turning it off. But mm. I don't see anybody with the phone up to their ears. Interesting. So. But yeah, so the jury didn't hear any of that or see the only footage they saw was her being walked to the car and getting in the car. And then they stopped it. Well, Judge Kemp allowed the video footage to be shown, but did not allow prosecution to question Sergeant Brianna Valentine about the unusual preferential treatment that Geiger received, saying, I don't think there's anything relevant to the issue at hand considering the murder in this case. As the body cam footage of both them being tended to by officers played, Bertram Jean, Beau's father, wept and hid his face against the courtroom wall. His wife, Allison, Beau's mom, bent over with her face in her hands. When the video stopped, Judge Kemp apologized to the Jean family for playing the footage in their presence. The Jeans left the courtroom, and according to the Dallas Morning News, a low wail could be heard from the court's hallway. Can you, I mean, it's, it's his well, last moments. They gave them no warning yeah. that this was about to be played. When I was, when I, when I served on that jury, they showed one picture of the infant, and before it was shown, their attorney said, my clients are going to leave the room. They don't want to be here for this. And they got up and left and then it was shown and then it was taken down before. So she should have definitely given a heads up that something very upsetting is about to be played that you probably don't want to see. Mm -hmm. But it was on them before they probably knew what was going on. I mean, yeah, before they could even leave. Additional witnesses were called to the stand. Martin Rivera. Geiger's partner was soon questioned by the prosecution. The prosecutor asked him what a reasonable person should be doing after shooting someone. The prosecutor asked, should you be given a hundred percent of the attention to the person dying in front of you? To which Rivera answered, yes. The prosecutor then asked, should you be sending text messages? Rivera answered, no. So she's texting her partner. Yep. While she's on the phone with 911. And we'll get into it a lot more on her testimony. But they're texting very sexually explicit messages. Not at this point. Not when she's on the phone with 911. Yes. By that point, she's just like, oh, God, I messed up. Prior to shooting both of them, she was on the phone with him and then texting him. And Snapchatting him. And Snapchatting very sexually explicit things. And then when she shoots him. She's on the phone with 911, texting him, I need you, I fucked up, yada, yada, yada. Yes, and that, that'll that be in the when she's on the stand. But I think there was some issue that folks had with bringing their sexual relationship into it. But I do think that, and that was part of the defense's objection up top, was that the cell phone interaction between the two of them outside, like prior to the shooting was irrelevant. But the prosecution, part of their argument was she was distracted by this, A, and B, the defense's uh, argument that she was so exhausted Mm -hmm. was sort of sidelined by this very explicit, you want to touch these kind of texting. So I, as a woman, listen, I don't like to get slut shamed. I don't like when other women get slut shamed. If you want to have a sexual relationship with your partner, that's kosher. If you want to do it while he's married and you're cool with that, that's also kosher. You do you do you. That's fine. But in this case, I don't think it was trotted out to slut shame her. No, it was trotted out very carefully because the content of the message, notwithstanding, it was the fact that she was engaged in a conversation and was perhaps making future plans that night and severely distracted and severely distracted. I don't think it was, oh, you're an immoral, bad person. You're a Jezebel, bad woman. I think it's Listen, you are distracted by and think of the things that distract us, right? Work, money, sex, love, whatever. So this is a big one. Yeah. The prosecution then asked another DPD officer about a phrase that would become a cornerstone of the state's case against Geiger. He asked when an officer is faced with a possible unauthorized person in a building or a residence, should that officer take, quote, cover and concealment and wait for backup? The officer testifying confirmed that, yes, an officer should take cover and concealment for the officer's safety and the safety of the person inside. And this is part of the DPD's de-escalation training that uh, Geiger supposedly, well, there's evidence that Geiger attended this de-escalation training in April 2018. And again, we'll get into it in her testimony, but she apparently didn't remember. And she says as much. But the de-escalation training is part of avoiding these violent interactions with police is to say, 
in a situation where you can't assess what's going on and you may and you be, think you're in danger or not yet, but you think you're walking into danger. Yeah. Do not walk in there. Yes. Close the door. If you have the opportunity, you can close the door and go out, call for backup. Yes. Another key witness the prosecution called was Joshua Brown, Botham's neighbor from across the hall. Brown testified the police knocked on his door as well as Botham's door earlier in the day in response to a noise complaint. Neither of them were responsible for the noise. The two chatted and suggested that perhaps the noise complaint was because both men smoked marijuana, which could sometimes be smelled in the hallway. That was the first time the two neighbors ever met, although Brown testified that he often heard both them singing Drake and gospel songs from across the hall when Brown was coming and going from his apartment. Brown then testified that he left his apartment to go watch a football game. He returned home before 10 p.m. He heard two gunshots then heard Geiger in the hallway after the shooting, crying and saying she was in the wrong apartment. Brown's testimony was critical to the state's case, as it contradicted Geiger's story that prior to firing the shots, she loudly announced, Let me see your hands. It stands to reason that if Brown could easily hear both them singing while he was in his apartment, he would have also heard Geiger loudly yelling. And she testified to that and was asked, Why wouldn't you the neighbor here? And she said, I don't know. And again, I wonder if it's part of coping that you've taken somebody's life by failing to follow your protocol, failing to act reasonably, that you maybe rewrite the story in your head to try to to try to make yourself feel better and say, no, I know for sure he he was running at me. I know for sure he I yelled at him first. I know for sure I tried to save his life, even if none of those things are true, either You're either in the way that she says it in her testimony, it's almost like she's trying to convince herself, not like she's trying to lie to get out of something, but like, no, I did that. I I know I did. I know I did that. I know I did that. It's almost like, did you turn the stove off? Like, I know I did. I know. Okay. For a everyday person. Yes. Who would be one person that shouldn't go into that train of thought? A police officer. Yeah. If anyone should be eagle eye focused and be able to recall every detail of a of a crime scene especially one where they're the assailant it should be a cop that is trained to go when, for these types of situations mm-hmm. her training just fucking as the brits would say she her head she, what do they say <laughs> she lost her head yeah I mean, and it seems like it. And she, well, like I said, we'll directly quote her testimony. And she testifies to so much. She's like, I was just so afraid and everything just froze. Texas Ranger David Armstrong was the lead investigator after the Rangers were asked to investigate by DPD Chief Renee Hall. Armstrong testified to the location of the shell casings near the dishwasher in the kitchen toward the front of the apartment. He also testified about the warped strike plate on the door to Botham's apartment. Other residents testified that the doors of Southside Flats would not lock on their own and sometimes did not even close fully on their own. Armstrong's examination of the strike plate showed the screws had been screwed too tightly, creating a strike plate that bowed out and kept the door from latching. The jury was then removed from the courtroom as the sides argued over the presentation of part of Ranger Armstrong's testimony. Defense attorneys wanted Ranger Armstrong to testify to the location of Botham when he was shot, based on the placement of Botham's shoes. But because body cam footage showed Botham's shoes were moved when officers who arrived on the scene rendered aid, Judge Kemp did not allow Armstrong to share this opinion. And also other DPD officers testified that when there's someone in distress, that preservation of the crime scene comes second to preservation of life. So they said, yeah, we ran in and we were moving stuff all over. I would hope so. Yeah. Then, outside the presence of the jury, Ranger Armstrong testified that he felt that Geiger acted reasonably under the circumstances. Prosecutors objected to allowing this testimony because that finding is for the jury to make on the totality of the evidence, not based on one officer's opinion. Judge Kemp agreed. And again, that's going to that's not for him to say. I mean, that's he's testifying to his opinion, which in certain cases. that's. But isn't if you're an expert witness and they're asking you, he to wasn't te- testifying as an expert. He's testifying okay. as an investigator. So if he had been testifying as, as an expert. I he could have possibly given his opinion and it would have been allowed. Yes, but he in this case he's testifying as an investigator gotcha. as here are the facts as I investigated them. And also the juries that's l- literally one of the elements that they have to decide on and having someone that's a Texas Ranger that's prejudicial that's more prejudicial than it is helpful because he's going to be seen as this 
exalted figure, which he should be. I mean, he's an expert. He's an investigator. He's arguably talked to literally everybody that lived at Southside Flats right. at the time. But that could sway them versus the weighing all the evidence. True. Yeah, for sure. With the jury back in the courtroom, Detective Stephen Cleary then testified that in his investigation of the layout of the apartment complex, there were several distinct differences in the third and fourth floors. For one, Botham's apartment was the only one with a bright red doormat out front. Second, the roof line was visible from the fourth floor parking area that would not be visible from the third. Photos of the interior of the apartments were entered into evidence, showing the difference between Geiger's and Botham's layouts. Geiger had a small table in the walkway between her kitchen and the living room, and although both apartments had couches on the same wall, Geiger's TV sat up on a tall TV stand. So again, there's a lot of opportunity for her to realize, oh shit, this isn't my apartment. Yeah, and he, I mean, he was sitting in the dark, there was some light from his laptop monitor, but I just, there's just a lot of signposts. A, a lot of holes in the story. There's a lot of signposts. Well, in... The whole reason for the testimony about the the boat out plate and everything is she that's why she was able to get into his apartment because it didn't it hadn't locked fully. So even though she put her keys in to unlock it, it kind of just popped open. Yes. And that's what too they, they said when you put her key in his lock, it flashed red. So she put the key in the lock. It flashed red, but it's because the door wasn't. So it doesn't matter because the door wasn't locked, like latched. You know, when you close the door and it goes click. Yeah. It no clicked. It didn't click. And so she was able to put the key in. Obviously wasn't looking because it flashed red and just opened the door anyway. Yeah. Well, following additional testimony, the state rested its case. At that time, the defense moved for a directed verdict. In Texas, if the state fails to prove all the elements of the offense alleged in the complaint, the defendant is entitled to a directed verdict of not guilty. Geiger's defense claimed that the state did not prove each element of the murder indictment by failing to prove that Geiger knowingly and intentionally caused Botham's death. The defense went on to ask for a directed verdict on both manslaughter and criminal negligence as well, claiming the prosecution did not prove those crimes either. Judge Kemp denied all three motions. Every trial I've seen, when the plaintiffs rest, the defense moves for a directive verdict. You just kind of always... It's, again, one of those things. You should just, just do it. You're just going to do it. Yeah. Maybe it happens. It probably won't, but you got to do it anyways. Yeah. Well, so this is where we're going to stop for this episode. And in the next episode, we're going to get to the defense's side, Geiger's actual testimony, the verdict, and everything after The sentencing. That. And, yeah. yeah. And some other... Suspicious, maybe not suspicious things that have happened since uh, in just in the past day. So what do we think so far? Well, I think so far, I hope that this isn't too tedious for the listeners, but I think it's important that we say everything that we've presented to you today is directly from the trial. Right. We're yes. not saying, well, this is a thing that this we is what we think. No. It, I mean, I we, mean, we, we did say we think she's of. An asshole. I mean, what, but eh, you know, I don't say we were giving you our opinion, but I'm yeah. saying it's not like there's an argument over what happened because it was on video. Yeah. So, yeah. and this is a huge testament to how important body cams are. Right. But a ton of this stuff can be proven because it's on video. Yeah. It's on video. And if you ever think to yourself, I don't think she was texting while they were saving his life. Go look. It's, it's on, on video. It's on YouTube, dummy. It's Go look video. at it. So yeah. I think that's the problem I have when, you know, people, it's all well and good to have an opinion. Here's the thing. This kind of stuff, it gets, everybody gets emotional about it. I understand. But A, you weren't, you weren't in the courtroom. And B, if you are curious about the courtroom, you can go pretend like you were because you can go and watch it. And all the things that we've presented are there. The strike plate on the door. There's not only are there photos of the warped strike plate, but there's a video of them taking her key and taking his key and putting it in and showing him what it does. And so this was a very well presented case from the prosecution, and it was all backed up by testimony by cops, rangers. I mean, it's just a solid case. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing: when someone goes, "I don't think she should have gotten murder." articulate why do you understand yeah. that the question is did you knowingly intentionally cause this person's death and all of this evidence shows yes you did yeah and so that's your your gut reaction may say well i think murder is someone you know ted bundy stalking someone in the night that is but also in some cases murder is someone behaving unreasonably 
and knowingly and intentionally causing the death of another person. And that is what happened here. One hundred percent. Yeah, this is uh, I mean, it's obviously, like you said, a very emotional case. It brings up emotions in a lot of people. We got emotional. What is so what uh, I have to tip my hat is that the prosecution and the didn't allow for those emotions to rule everything. They, I mean, they, they of course played to an emotional side of it, yeah. but they presented facts and a very well laid out case mm-hmm. and did their due diligence. And t- like I said, just tons of photos, videos, yes. 3d models. You can't argue with that. Yeah. Well, we will pick this up on part two next Wednesday. Heather. Yes. We have got some live shows coming up. No. Talk to me about them. All right. Let me tell you. We have got The Cult, which is improvised comedy, on October 18th at 10 p.m. We just did a cult show, and it was riotous. The audience was... (laughs) Riotous is a great word. The audience was out of control. It was was a wild audience. Loved it. It It was was great. It was... Tommy goes, I've never got so many fist bumps after a show. (laughs) It's like I didn't get one fist bump. <laughs> uh, it was a lot of fun. It was if a you super don't, fun show. if you don't know, improvised comedy is Christy, Tommy, and a couple of our friends. We get on stage and we get one word, and we do basically like uh, what you would see on SNL, like a sketch, but it's all made up on the spot. Yeah. And, and a lot of them. Oh, but yes. this time I got the suggestion instead of one word. I asked. Pull out your phone. We'll take the first one we hear. What was your most recent Google search? And that was fun. Yes. Mine would have been foot odor. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, it's a lot of fun. And come out to Dallas Comedy House October 18th at 10 p.m. And we'll hang out with you on the patio afterwards. Definitely. Also, even better. The next night. The next night. The very next night. October 19th. Also at 10 p.m. We are doing a Sinisterhood Live podcast recording with a super cool, super spooky Halloween topic that we've yep. already picked and we're so super excited. Super fun. Awesome uh, new theater. Yes. It's very cool. The patio is going to be bumping that night. We would love to see you there. Rumor has it. There may be some special exclusive merch available. Maybe just a little bit. So come on out to Dallas Comedy House 3036 Elm on October 19th at 10 p.m. Also, heck, come both days. The 18th come both 10, days. Both days at 10 p.m. You can go to SinisterHood.com and click on live shows and you will get links to tickets and all the information and details that you need. Yes. Sinisterhood will always remain free, but if you wish to donate to our Patreon to help offset the cost of making and hosting the show, you can visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner. You'll get some sweet perks like Patreon-exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and because we started doing ads, we will have ad-free content if you're in the So Sinister and Ruling the Airwaves tiers. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us of pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. We love them. And if you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click shop in the top right corner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at on the internet? I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather, what about you? I am on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shoutouts. Haley Bomar. Ashlyn Schlitt. Holly Slicer, Samantha Moore. Amanda R. Christy Dinnan. Nicole Powers. Christine Blake. Allie Bauer. Amy Countryman. Amy Countryman. Sorry. We know Amy. <laughs> Angela Corrales. Also know Angela. She is a friend. Thank you so much, Angela. And Caitlin Barker. But thank you to all of us. Even if we don't know you personally, you are now our best friends. Yes, you are. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Make sure you join the Patreon Facebook group so we can share all kinds of fun stuff with you. And again, thank you so much for supporting the show. Yes. If you're in the Ruling the Airwaves tier, please send us a Facebook request for that group and we will approve you right away. Keep it creepy. Mwahaha. Sin is-